Well, good morning and welcome to our video service today. I wonder if this lockdown is making you feel weary, maybe even gloomy and downcast. Later in our service, we're going to be looking at two Psalms, 42 and 43, Psalms that were written to teach us what to do when we feel like that. But first of all, some news. Uh, we will be reopening the church building for Sunday services on the 13th of September, 13th of September. We've been working hard to make sure that we can do that uh, in line with the government regulations. And so the service will be a, a little bit different to what we're used to. Uh, if you come along, you'll need to maintain social distancing. You'll need to wear a face mask uh, unless you're under 11 or you're medically exempt. Uh, we're not allowed to sing. Uh, the service will be fairly short. And there won't be any creche, there won't be separate groups for children. Uh, we won't be celebrating communion together. Obviously, we'll be learning as we, we go along. Some of those things might change in future weeks as we see what we can do. Uh, the number of people that we can fit in the building is quite limited. Uh, we will be running a kind of booking system so that we know who's coming. That will be in place next week. Uh, but can I just ask you to, to do something? If you know now that you are planning to come on the 13th of September or uh, shortly afterwards, one of the weeks fairly soon afterwards, or if you know now that you're definitely not comfortable to come yet, it would really help us to know that as we plan. Uh, so please, if, if you know one of those things that you definitely intend to come or you definitely don't intend to come yet, please do get in touch and let me know. Uh, we'll be producing a lot more information over the next week to let you know what to do if you come and what you can expect when you come. If you do have any questions about that or you want to, to know any more, then do get in touch. Let's begin now by reading some verses from John's Gospel and from chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1, John describes here the, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. But he doesn't do it quite as we expect. He doesn't describe it in the way that we might describe a birth or the arrival of a person. He does it in the greatest possible terms. He calls Jesus the true light. All light, all knowledge, all life comes from Jesus. And as, God, as Jesus comes, God himself enters into the world that he'd made. I'm just going to read some verses from uh, John chapter 1, verse 9. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, as we think about Jesus who came and what he came to do, let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that Jesus is the eternal Son, that he is the one by whom the whole world was created, that he is the true light, the one who gives life to everyone. Every one of us depend every moment on him, on his sustaining power. And so when we see who Jesus is, we praise you that he came into the world that he had, had created, that he became flesh, and that he did that knowing that he would be rejected by those who were his own, those who he created, that he'd even be put to death. And we praise you that he did that so that all who trust in him could have eternal life. 
that we could be given that amazing status. We could become children of God, enter your family. We thank you that in Jesus we see all your glory on display. We see his great love and grace, his truth and mercy. And so we thank and praise you this morning for sending Jesus to save us. We thank you that as your children, we can come before you as our Father and bring our request to you. And we pray uh, this week for the children uh, among us as they're going back to school. And we pray for them as they have to uh, adapt to not only the new things of a new school year, new teachers and, and classes, but also um, the new uh, coronavirus arrangements as well. We pray that you would uh, help them with that, help them to trust in you in all the different things that they come across. Pray for those who are preparing to go off to university, uh, maybe for the, the first time or returning. We pray that you'll help them with all the preparations for that. We pray that as they go, as they take this, uh, this big step of, of independence, of, of growth, that they would grow in their walk with you as well. Pray that as they move away, they would find a church where they can learn and where they can serve you. We know that uh, COVID cases are rising in our area. And so we pray for the authorities. We pray for your grace and your mercy. We pray that uh, this would serve as a, a wake-up call to people, reminding us of our frailty and our need to turn to you. We thank you so much that we can reopen, that we can plan to do that in a few weeks' time, that we can meet together again. We pray that you'd give us wisdom as we plan and arrange that, and give us wisdom as we plan to come as we do that, that we'd be able to meet together safely. And we pray this morning for uh, our Bella Boys Home in India, one of our mission partners. We thank you that you have supplied all of their needs at this time and that they're even able to provide food for many of the, the poor boys they care for while they're away at home with their families. We ask for wisdom for the staff. We pray that the care and the love that they have for the boys under their, their care would uh, be evident to people in the area around them, that the people might see their good deeds and glorify you. And we pray, our God, this morning, that as we uh, read your word, that you would speak to us, you would shine your light into our minds and our hearts. Help us to grow in faith and in love for you, our God, our joy and our delight. Amen. I'm going to read from the Bible now. We're reading uh, two Psalms, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Uh, they're two separate Psalms in the way that they're laid out in our Bibles, but uh, you'll be able to see as we read them that, that really they're two parts of the same Psalm. Uh, some of the verses in each are almost identical. And uh, you'll notice, I hope, a, a kind of repeated chorus. Look out for that as I read, see if you can spot it. I do follow along in a Bible if you have one there, or uh, follow the link in the description for an online version. So Psalm 42 and 43. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, 
At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God. To God, my joy and my delight, I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Well, before we look at that together, let's praise God as we sing. O God, beyond all praising. Now the words will be on the screen so that you can join in or you can just listen along. O God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that Songs cannot repay, for we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number, and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before. Well, as I said, this morning we're looking at both Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Uh, they're, they're two separate psalms written in our Bibles, but really two parts of the same song. And the easiest way to show that is that they share a chorus. Uh, verse 5 of Psalm 42 is repeated again in, in verse 11, and then again in verse 5 of Psalm 43. And in between there are three uh, kind of verses, stanzas, if you like. And the chorus gives us a sense of what this psalm is about. Let me read it to you. Uh, verse 5 of Psalm 42. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. 
We can see, can't we, that this is a psalm written by someone who is downcast, someone who is deeply troubled, weighed down by, by grief or by weariness. But we also see that that's not all this psalm is about. It's also a psalm about the hope that there is in God. And so if you're feeling weary or troubled this morning, or if your experience ever includes gloom and, and sadness, then this psalm is for you. So let's look at it together. We're going to look at it uh, in three parts, covering the, the three stanzas, the three verses leading up to the three choruses. So first of all, this psalm looks back at the way things used to be. In verse 1, we have the picture of a drought. We have to imagine a deer kind of tongue hanging out, desperate for some water, looking everywhere, but all the rivers have dried up. There's no water to be found. And the psalmist feels like that about God. He's longing for God. He's desperate for some refreshment. But wherever he looks, God can't be found. When can I go and meet with God, he asks in verse 2. Now, later on in the, in the psalm, we find out that he's in the region of Jordan. He's up in the, the north of the country. He's away from the temple in Jerusalem. He can't get back there to worship God. And he's full of sorrow, isn't he? Tears have flowed day and night. And it's made much worse by all the people around him who are, who are questioning God, mocking him, really. Where is your God in all this? Why doesn't he help you? Why are you so gloomy if you believe in God? Now, I think this psalm has a particular application for us at the moment, doesn't it? We want to meet up as God's people, as a church again, to be able to meet to worship God. But we can't. We're not kept from meeting by distance, but by a pandemic. But of course, the effect is the same, isn't it? And of course, we could say, well, because Jesus has come, we don't need to go to the temple to meet with God. We have access to him everywhere. And that is gloriously true, isn't it? There isn't a special building that we need to go to. It's why we can do so much as a church online. But notice in verse 4 that the psalmist also looks back on how he used to go with the multitudes, with other people. Part of his joy was, was being together as the people of God, singing and celebrating with joy together. That's what we miss at this time, isn't it? That's the thing that we can't do online, being together. And in fact, the word church means a, a gathering, an, an assembly of people. God intends us to gather as his people. In fact, he commands us to do that. God has made us physical people, people with, with bodies. And so meeting virtually in a, a kind of disembodied way just doesn't, doesn't really do it for us, does it? We're doing the best that we can online at the moment, but it, it's not actually church because it's not a gathering of God's people. And so it's not surprising that we feel like the psalmist here. It's not good for us not to gather. The psalmist felt like that when he couldn't meet. We feel like that too, don't we? Or maybe our tears come for another reason. Perhaps weariness has set in. Maybe you're a parent and you can't wait for school to restart next week. You know, however much you love your family, being stuck together in a house where you can't really go anywhere, trying to fill the time every day since March, that is wearying, isn't it? Perhaps for you, you, you've barely left your home for months, and now you find that you're anxious about doing that at all. Maybe you don't even know why it is, but for some reason your soul is downcast. Maybe you find yourself weeping in the night and you're not even sure why. Well, this psalm was written to teach us when we feel like that. The writer is saying to us, look, this is what I did in that situation. This is how it was for me. Learn from me. 
And in verse 5, we get the first of those repeating choruses. In the chorus, the writer is, is talking to himself. He feels downcast. He feels gloomy. He's not, he's not trying to deny it. That is the way it is. We all have days like that, I think, don't we? But that's not the only truth. He reminds himself of something else as well, that he can put his hope in God. Hope means looking forward with certainty that things will be better in the future. Although he's downcast now, he knows that light will come. He knows that he will be praising God in the end. There's a kind of a, a dogged defiance in verse 5, isn't there? He's saying, this is not how I feel right now, but I am going to hang on to God. That is what he's saying. And sometimes we need to do that too, don't we? There's no need to deny the way we feel sometimes. But we do need to remind ourselves that that is not the only truth. As believers in Jesus, gloom is not the end of the story. Our hope is in God. We will praise him in the end. So the writer, first of all, looks back with longing at the way things were. But secondly, that this psalm also looks around at the way things are now. Notice how wonderfully honest this psalm is. Verse 5, the psalmist has, has kind of tried to talk himself around. He's reminded himself of God, he's reminded himself that his hope is in God. And so what's the result? Well, verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. You see, despite reminding himself of good and true things about God, it's not instant sunshine. There's still this gloom hanging over him. And sometimes that's the way it is, isn't it? Sometimes we know that God is good. We trust with all our heart that he will make it right in the end, but still we're downcast. Well, we can tell ourselves there's no good reason to be gloomy, and yet we still are. In verse 7, the, uh, the writer describes his experience. This is what he says, verse 7, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I guess not many of us have managed to get to the beach this year, but I'm sure you can remember what it's like to play in the waves. Uh, maybe as, as children you used to do that, maybe it's something you still enjoy doing. Uh, as a child, uh, maybe you used to do this as well, I, I used to do that thing where you lie in the shallow water there and just let the waves break over you as they roll in. There's a, a kind of wonderful sense of powerlessness, isn't there? As you're tossed around, you feel the weight of the water crashing down on you. But it's also exhausting. You have to exert all your effort just to stay in the same place. The, the, the water just pummels you, it's relentless, and soon it wears you out. And that's how the psalmist feels. He's being pummeled over and over again by his troubles. There's no relief. It feels in verse 9, he says, as if God has forgotten him. And yet, can you see that he is also full of faith in God? Look carefully at what he says in verse 7. He's feeling crushed by waterfalls and waves, and yet he knows that they are God's waterfalls and waves. He calls them your waves and breakers. The troubles that come over him are not some random out-of-control event. They're at God's command, directed by God. Verse 8 is really quite extraordinary, I think. By day, the Lord directs his love, literally his steadfast love. It's a word in the Bible for his, his covenant, unbreakable, unchangeable love. Here's this, this writer being pummeled by God's waves, and yet in the very next line he goes on to, to say that that is part of God's unbreakable love. God's love hasn't changed. Somehow, though he doesn't know how, these troubles are part of God's loving care for him. 
And even in verse 9, where he says, why have you forgotten me? He calls God my rock. You see, this psalm is full of, of questions, but they're not questions of doubt, are they? He doesn't understand why all this is, is going on. He doesn't really understand his experience. But despite that, he knows he is certain that God is present, even though God feels absent. And so he's able to argue with himself again in verse 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him my saviour and my God. What can we learn from the experience of this psalm? Well, we learn, don't we, that even in the relentless pummeling of our troubles, God directs his steadfast love. Hebrews 13 reminds us that God disciplines those he loves. The troubles that God sends are signs of God's love for you. They show that he's prepared to commit to shaping and, and to forming you. Even when we think God has forgotten about us, the God who seems absent is our rock. He is our only security. The God who troubles us is the only God we can rely on to save us. He is God our saviour. We learn too from this psalm that, that asking questions isn't always a sign of doubting God. It just means that we don't understand what God is doing. And how could we understand it? His wisdom is so much greater than ours, isn't it? He has the, the whole of the universe, the whole of history in his plan. It's no wonder we don't understand our little slice of it. Now verse 18 gives us a, a really practical thing that we can do in trouble. It says there, at night his song is with me. In times of trouble, songs are a great help to us, aren't they? Perhaps it's one of the, the Psalms. Maybe it's a song or a hymn that you know. Often when we can't think what to say, just singing or, or praying the words of a song reminds us of the truth about God, doesn't it? Truth that we can easily lose sight of in the gloom. So we've seen the way that uh, it used to be and the way it is now. And then as we move into Psalm 43, that the focus shifts to the future. This psalmist we see trusts God to bring him home. He trusts God to bring him home. At verse 2 of Psalm 43 is almost identical to verse 9 of Psalm 42. But the psalm isn't just carrying on the same way. Here in Psalm 43, the, the psalmist has turned to prayer. And what he's asking God for is, is a rescue mission. So look at verse 1. He's asking God to vindicate him. He's asking God to rescue him. Verse 3, he asks God to send a search party. Send out your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain. He wants God to reveal himself in truth. He wants God to bring him back to the temple, the place where God dwells, and back even further to the altar so that he can worship God again. He longs to come out of his, his exile. He longs to come home. And notice what he calls God, verse 4. He calls God, my joy and my delight or my exceeding joy, some translations say. Even though his soul is downcast, even though he's weeping day and night, God is still his joy, his delight. I don't think that's a contradiction, is it? That even though our situation might make us weep, we know that God is where our joy comes from. We still reach out for God. We know that, that he is our delight. That is why it's so painful when he seems absent. And as so as we reach the end of this psalm, actually nothing has changed, has it, in the writer's circumstances. But everything has changed in his outlook. He's been speaking truth to himself, reminding himself of the certainty of God's love, the certain hope that God will bring him home in the end. 
And it's that that helps him to hold on in the darkness. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this prayer for a rescue has been answered, hasn't it? God has sent out a search party. When Jesus came into our world, he said, I am the light. I am the truth. Those two things that the the, the psalmist asks for in verse 3. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. He came to lead God's people home. He died on the cross so that we could return to worship God and to call him our Father. God is now our joy, our delight, because Jesus has washed us of our sins and made us his children. And like all psalms, this psalm is first of all about Jesus. It describes Jesus' experience. Jesus is the one, isn't he, who came into our world as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus faced the taunts of his enemies who who even hounded him to death and then mocked him as he hung on the cross. Jesus appeared to have been abandoned by God. The waters of God's judgment crushed him. And yet that wasn't all. Afterwards, God raised him to life and brought him home, exalted him to the highest place in heaven. As Christian believers, that is our king. That is the one that we follow. Not one who sailed through life without a care, but one who wept, who was crushed. One who in all of that didn't for an instant doubt God's steadfast love one who was raised and exalted to his rightful place. And so as we follow him through this sin-sick world, we can expect, can't we, that our experience will be similar. We will weep. We will grow weary. It will feel sometimes as if God has forgotten us. Sometimes all we'll have are tears and questions. And one thing more, We have hope in a God who came to rescue us, a God who raises the dead, a God who one day will lead us home. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Let's pray, shall we? Our God and Father, we thank you for your word that speaks to our our deepest needs. We pray for those in our church family who are weary, downcast, gloomy, weeping today. We thank you that wherever we are, you are with us by your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would speak your truth and be a very close comfort to us today. We thank you, O God, that in our lostness, in the darkness, you sent a search party. You sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the light, the truth. Thank you that he entered our darkness. He experienced our pain, our weeping that he even went to the cross. And because of that, he can lead us home. We thank you that our hope in you is not a, not a forlorn hope, it's not wishful thinking, but it is a certain, confident hope that in the end we will praise you, that we will be with you forever. And so help us to hold on to you, To trust in you, we pray, to give you honour and glory, to find you our joy and our delight, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, we're going to sing of the steadfast love of God displayed in Jesus, the one who came to rescue us and to lead us home. Deep, deep 
love of Jesus, vast unmeasured, boundless free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Well, let's remind ourselves once again of the hope that we have in Christ. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. <laughs> 